Hey guys, this is uh, 3.2, second derivative and the behavior of functions. So in 3.1, uh, we talked about the first derivative and the behavior of functions, so here we'll be looking at the second derivative and what does that tell us about how a function is behaving. So what are we going to look at here? We're going to talk about how the second derivative relates to something called concavity. Uh, we'll look at things called hypercritical values and points of inflection. Uh, we'll talk about a point of diminishing returns. And just like we had a first derivative test, we'll have something called the second derivative test. Okay, so concavity, what is that? So let's say that for some function f, that the derivative f prime exists over some interval i. Then we say f is concave up on that interval if the derivative is increasing, right? So here's an example of concave up. So a uh, way to remember that would be concave up, kind of looks like a cup. Uh, or a smiley face, right? Um, but uh, what does that mean if the derivative is increasing? Well, what that means is, remember the derivative gives you the slope of the tangent lines. So if we look at these tangent lines that are drawn here, uh, the first one to the left is pretty negative for that slope. The next one is still negative, but not quite as negative. Then we get one that's zero, and then we hit some that are starting to be positive and then really positive. So if I start out negative, go to zero, and become positive, then my uh, slopes of those tangent lines are increasing. The first derivative is increasing. So that's what it looks like when a function is concave up. Uh, the opposite of that is called concave down, and that's where the derivative is decreasing. Um, so that looks like this. So here we say concave down, maybe like a frown. Um, and uh, again, if the derivative is decreasing, then that means the slopes of these tangent lines are decreasing. So notice the first one over here on the left is really positive. The next one still has a positive slope, but not quite so positive. We get one that's got a slope of zero, uh, and then a negative slope, and then a really negative slope. Right? So the slopes of those tangent lines are starting positive, going to zero, becoming negative. So those slopes are decreasing, and the derivative is decreasing. So that's what it looks like when a function is concave down. All right, so since the rate at which the slopes of those tangent lines uh, are changing uh, is given by the second derivative, right? The rate of change of the rate of change, the second derivative, we can use that second derivative to tell us the concavity of a function. So if at some x value c, the second derivative is positive, the function is concave up. The rate of change of those slopes is positive. If at some x value c the second derivative is negative, then the function is concave down at that x value. The rate of change of those slopes is negative. Uh, if the second derivative is zero, it's just neither concave up nor concave down. So that's a special thing when the second derivative is zero. That's what we call a hypercritical value. So just like for the first derivative we had critical values, for the second derivative we have now hypercritical values, supercritical, whatever. Um, so then the second derivative is zero, or when the second derivative is undefined, then we say that x value is a hypercritical value for our function f. So if I say find the hypercritical values, what you do is find the second derivative, see where it's zero, or where it's undefined. Um, just like critical values, a function can only change concavity at a hypercritical value. It can only go from concave up to concave down or concave down to concave up when it goes through one of these hypercritical values. Um, but just like before, that doesn't mean that it's going to have to change um, at a hypercritical value. It can hit a hypercritical value and stay concave down or stay concave up, whatever it might be. But these are the only places where it can change concavity. So of course, if we're going to start talking about w how do we know where a function is concave up or concave down, these hypercritical values are going to play a role, just like the critical values did for the first derivative and increasing or decreasing. All right, so what is an inflection point? Well, an inflection point is just a hypercritical value where the concavity actually does change. So an inflection point can look uh, like a few different things. So this first example on the left, um, at x sub zero, x naught, whatever you call that, um, at this height p, we started out concave down, and then at p we changed to concave up. So that point is called an inflection point. 
right? Notice this is an inflection point and not an inflection value. So if I ask you for an inflection point, you actually have to give me a point with an X value and a Y value. All right, th this middle guy is another example of that. We started out concave down on the left, and then we hit that guy X zero, and we went to concave up. Um, notice that uh, in our first example, the second derivative was zero. Um, and in this example, the second derivative did not exist. Since there's a vertical tangent line there, the first derivative does not exist. And if the first derivative does not exist, the second derivative does not exist either. Um, and we'll see uh, that the way you find these hypercritical values is to figure out where the second derivative is zero or it does not exist. All right, our last example, we went from concave up on the left and then we hit this point and started being concave down. So that is also an inflection point. Uh, and this guy also is uh, a point where the second derivative is zero. All right. Now let's look at what is a point of diminishing returns, right? So that's a business term. Um, and all it is is it's an inflection point where the concavity changes, but especially it has to change from, from concave up to concave down, right? So that was like our, our example where we were concave up and then we hit this point and then we were concave down, right? So we would call this point x naught comma p a point of diminishing returns for this function. All right, so now let's look at how do the first and second derivative relate together. If you know what the first and second derivative are, that is whether they are positive or negative, what does that mean the graph looks like? So this is a handy table that you can reference um, to tell you that. So let's start first with uh, when the first derivative is negative and the second derivative is negative. That's this guy here. All right, so first derivative is negative means that I'm gonna be decreasing. Second derivative negative means that I'm gonna be concave down. And the only thing that can really look like is something like this graph, right? So something like that. Um, if the first derivative is positive and the second derivative is negative, then I'm increasing in concave down and that can really only look something like this. Uh, if the first derivative is negative, second derivative positive, then I'm decreasing concave up, looks something like that. And lastly, if both are positive, then I'm increasing in concave up and it looks something like that. So this should be more of a reference. Um, uh, if you want to know what does a function look like when the first derivative is positive or negative, the second derivative is positive or negative. You can reference this and you know it sort of looks something like that. All right, so now let's move on to this second derivative test to find relative extrema. All right, so we had a first derivative test to find relative extrema. Here we have a second derivative test, again, to find relative extrema. Remember, relative extrema are relative maximums or minimums. Okay, so this second derivative test, what is it? Well, if the first derivative and the second derivative exist at some point x equals c, and x equals c is a critical value, right? So if the first derivative exists and x equals c is a critical value, that's the same thing as saying that f prime of c is zero, right? If the derivative exists but it's a critical value, it has to equal zero, right? So if you have f prime of c equals zero and the second derivative exists, then uh, you'll have a relative minimum Sorry about that. You'll have a relative minimum um, at x equals c if the first derivative is, or I'm sorry, the second derivative is positive. Right, so remember, second derivative positive means you are concave up like a cup, and that point right there at the bottom would be a relative minimum. If you take your critical value and you plug it into the second derivative and you get a negative number, then that's something like a hill, uh, and that point at the top your critical value there would be a relative maximum, right? So you can use the second derivative to tell you if it's a relative maximum or minimum. If you get a positive number from the second derivative, it's a minimum because you were concave up. If you get a negative number from the second derivative, it's a maximum because you were concave down. If you get zero, then this test doesn't work, right? And you would have to go back and use the first derivative test. All right, so what does that look like? So this first one on the left, um, we've got the first derivative at c, x equals c is zero, so it's a critical value, the derivative exists. 
and the second derivative is positive. So again, that has to look like it's concave up. And this point on the bottom is uh, when x equals c. And since it's concave up all around c, it looks like an angle. For this second example, the first derivative again is 0, so it's a critical value and the derivative exists. The second derivative here is negative, so it's concave down. And that point right there looks like it's a maximum, and the second derivative test tells us it is a relative maximum. So you can use a second derivative test uh, to tell you whether a critical value is a maximum or minimum. Again, if you get the second derivative is equal to 0, then it just doesn't work. Um, and you'll have to use a first derivative test. But if it's not zero, then this is helpful. All right, let's look at some examples. So first off, uh, if I say construct a sketch of the graph uh, of some function that has these properties, right? So there'll be homework problems like this. Um, and this type of question uh, is likely to show up on a final exam. It has in the past. Uh, so I'm going to just describe a function, and then you would have to sketch it. All right, so here's my description of my function. So first off, it's going to pass through this point 0, 0. The first derivative at 4 is 0, and it's concave up everywhere. All right, so we're going to try to sketch this. So first, what do I have with this first piece that f passes through the point 0, 0? Well, that just means that I need to draw a dot to put a point at the origin 0, 0. And when I draw my function, it needs to go through that point. All right, this second piece of information, the first derivative at 4 is 0, that tells me that 4 is a critical value, right? So could be a place where there's a maximum or minimum, but I'm not sure yet. We'll have to look at everything else to figure that out. Since this last piece says f is concave up everywhere, then I can use my second derivative test, right? Concave up means my second derivative is positive. So that means the second derivative is positive everywhere. So especially the second derivative at 4 is also positive, right? If you're positive everywhere, you're definitely positive at 4. Um, so that uh, means that by the second derivative test, at x equals 4, we have a minimum. Right? So those two pieces of information give me that I need to be concave up everywhere and have the minimum be at 4. So now I can sketch my graph. So concave up means I want to look like a smiley face. I need to make sure I go through this point 0, 0. And I need to make sure I hit my minimum right there at 4. Whoops, I didn't quite do that. Let's try that again. So I've got my point at 0, 0. Hopefully you guys get the idea. We want to hit the minimum at 4. That looks better, but not great. But that's OK. The point is hit the minimum at 4. And notice here, of course, we're sketching, right? It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to do all the things that it's supposed to. All right, so this graph does pass through 0, 0. First derivative at 4 is 0, and it is concave up everywhere. Here's another example. Um, so if I give you that the first derivative is 0 at 0, and at 2, and at negative 2, and the second derivative is negative 2 times x, it says determine, if possible, whether the given critical values produce a relative maxima or minima. Relative maximum or minima. Well, for this, we're going to use the second derivative test again. So since I've got the first derivative is 0 for these three x values, all I have to do is plug them into the second derivative, and I should be able to determine if it's a maximum or minimum, as long as I don't get 0. So let's first check what's f double prime, right, the second derivative of 0. So we took our first critical value, and we're going to plug it into the second derivative. Well, that's negative 2 times 0, which is 0. So the second derivative test here does not give us anything about this point x equals 0, so we'd say it's inconclusive. Inconclusive. All right, so we didn't know anything about the point where x is 0. What about uh, the next guy, which is when x is 2? Let's plug that in. What's f double prime, the second derivative at 2? Well, that's negative 2 times 2, which is negative 4. And really what I care about here is that this is a negative number, less than 0. So if I'm less than 0, that means I'm concave down. And if I'm concave down, that second derivative, t derivative test excuse me, tells me that here I have a relative maximum. So I have a relative maximum. 
All right, what about the last guy, which is the second derivative at negative two? So I wanna plug in my last critical value there into the second derivative. And when I do that, I, this time I get a positive four, right? Negative two times negative two. And really all I care about is that that is a positive number. If it's a positive number for the second derivative, I know I'm, whoops, not that. I'm concave up. And if I'm concave up, uh, remember that looks like this. So that means I'm gonna have a relative minimum. All right, so there I used my second derivative test to determine if these critical values gave us a relative minimum or a maximum. Here's another example. It says determine the hypercritical values and the interval intervals upon which this function f of x is concave up or concave down. All right, so this is gonna look really similar to when we tried to find the critical values and where a function was increasing or decreasing. But this time we're just gonna use the second derivative which will give us hypercritical values and tell us about the concavity. So in order to do that, first thing we have to do is figure out what is the second derivative. In order to find the second derivative, we need to find the first derivative. So what's the first derivative? We get a three x squared minus six x. For my second derivative, I get six x minus six. All right, so to find my hypercritical values, I wanna know where is my second derivative undefined or equal to zero. So if we look at this six x minus six, it's, uh, it's defined everywhere. It doesn't have anywhere that it's undefined. So we're not gonna get any hypercritical values from that, but we might get one by setting it equal to zero. So let's do that. Negative six x, uh, sorry, six x minus six equals zero. Well, that happens when x equals one. So that gives us x equals one as a hypercritical value. Let's see if I can write an x, there we go. And you wanna make sure you label that uh, HCV or you can write out hypercritical value and box that since it does say determine the hypercritical value that is part of our answer that's gonna be graded and all of that. So we wanna make sure we box that guy. All right, we only got one hypercritical value. So just like we did when we were looking at the first derivative, we're gonna draw a number line and use that hypercritical value one to break it up. All right, just like before, we're gonna have some test points, but here I'm not testing the first derivative, I wanna test the second derivative because that's gonna tell me about concavity. So pick your favorite number less than one, how about zero? Your favorite number greater than one, how about two? And we wanna determine the sign of the second derivative at these guys. So if I plug in uh, zero into the second derivative, what do I get? I get uh, six times zero minus six, so that's negative six. So what I care about here is that that's a negative number. If I plug in uh, two to the second derivative, what do I get? I get two times six is 12 minus six is six. And what I care about here is that that's a positive number. All right, so I know that this function is gonna be concave down on the side of my hypercritical value where I get a negative number and concave up on the side where I get a positive number. All right, so now all we need to do is write that down to answer this question. So I'm concave down on, and I need to give this as an interval. So all the way from negative infinity up to one. All right, and that's because I wanna I knew that over here on this side of my line uh, where x was one, I got a negative number for the second derivative. So that means I was concave down everywhere over there because there is no other uh, hypercritical value on that side. On the other side, uh, the right side of one, um, I got a positive number for the second derivative. So that means I got, I'm gonna be concave up from one and then all the way forever because there's no other critical value. So I'm concave up from one all the way out to infinity. All right, so there I have it. I've figured out my hypercritical values and where this function is concave up and concave down. And I definitely wanna make sure I give my answers as an interval, right? So let's figure out the intervals. All right, so that's that guy. Our last example, uh, we have a question about a point of diminishing returns. All right, so uh, this says that Sully Salon uses the model, whoops, excuse me. Sully Salon uses the model R of X 
is 600x squared minus x cubed over 20,000, uh, where x is between 0 and 400, to relate its revenue in thousands of dollars to the amount of money that it spends on advertising, also in thousands of dollars. Right, so this function, if I say x is 1, that means uh, Sully has spent uh, $1,000 on advertising, and this is going to spit out the amount of revenue that he'll get from that. All right, um, so that's what this function is. We're asked to find the point of diminishing returns. All right, so you have to remember the point of diminishing returns is where we go from concave up, like a cup, to concave down, like a frown. All right, that's a point of diminishing return. So what we need to do here is figure out where we concave up and where we concave down. And then whenever we go from concave up to concave down, that's the point we care about. So we're going to have to do the same thing we did before where we find the first and second derivative. Um, I don't have a lot of room here, so I'm just going to write down the second derivative for you and assume that you guys could do it. Um, one thing to notice here is that divided by 20,000 is just some number. Leave it out in the front um, the whole time you're taking derivatives. So the second derivative is 1 over 20,000 times 1,200 minus All right, so that's my second derivative. Of course, I had to take the first derivative before I did this in order to find it, but I'm going to let you guys verify that on your own. Um, so in order to find our point of diminishing returns, we need to figure out way where we are concave up or down. And in order to do that, we need to find our hypercritical values. So the question is, are there any x values where this second derivative is undefined? All right, so let's look at it. 1,200 minus 6x, and then divide by 20,000. No, that's not undefined anywhere. You can plug anything you want into that. So we're not going to get any hypercritical values from being undefined, but maybe we'll get some from setting it equal to 0. So let's set it equal to 0. So we get 1 over 20,000 times 1,200, 1,200 minus 6x equals 0. Uh, and then multiplying by 20,000, you just get 0 is 1,200 minus 6x. And then solving for x, you should get x equals 200. So we only had one hypercritical value, and it was when x equaled 200. So just like before, we're going to use this hypercritical value to break up our number line. Uh, and that's 200. We need to identify some test points, and we need to say what we're plugging them into, which is the second derivative. All right, so pick your favorite number less than 200. I'm going to choose 1 because it's easy. And then for my number greater than 200, let's choose 201. All right, so what you want to do is plug in 1 to the second derivative. When you do that, you should get something like 1194 divided by 20,000. Who cares what the actual number is? All we care is that it's a positive number. When you plug in 201, we'll get something like negative 6 over 20,000. Again, I don't care what the actual number is. I just care that it's a negative number there. All right, this... Uh, what I'm boxing here uh, is very important. That is showing your work for this problem. Without that, even if you have the right answer, I don't know whether or not you just plug this into your calculator and read it off the graph, or if you actually knew how to do this um, by hand. So that thing that I've boxed with the number line and the test points, just like in 3.1, is very important uh, for earning credit on an exam or anything like that. Uh, where you've shown me I know what I'm doing and here's my work. So make sure you have that. Uh, from here, uh, we notice that from the left of 200 over here, we were concave up because the second derivative was positive. And to the right of 200, we were concave down because the second derivative was negative. So hey, looky there, at that hypercritical value x equals 200, we went from concave up to concave down. So that value is going to be... Uh, where we have this point of diminishing returns. But notice that it says point of diminishing returns and not value of diminishing returns. So our answer needs to actually be a point. That point's going to have x value 200, and then y value, uh, well, whatever you get when you plug 200 in to your original equation. Right, so you have to make sure you actually give that uh, where you plug x equals 200 into the original equation. When you do that, I'll let you guys double check, but I got 800, right? So you're plugging that in, 
to this function up here that we started with. So our point of diminishing returns where we went from concave up to concave down is the point 200 comma 800. There's Tucker yawning at us. That's the end of 3.2 and here are the assigned problems. Uh, make sure you guys email me. Let me know if you have any questions over the notes. Um, please come to class with questions. Uh, if you don't understand any of the examples, we can look at those. Um, or if you start the homework and have questions over that, of course, we'll get those questions answered. All right, thanks.